Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Big Ideas Night Finance during coronavirus with Jill Schlesinger, Alexa Von Tobel, Antoinette M. Clark, and Trisha Clark Stone. We are so excited for tonight's conversation on a topic that is so important right now, finances. During this evening's event, we will be utilizing the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question, please feel free to ask it here and Sarah might just pull the question into conversation. Please connect with other readers and guests using the chat function. We'd love to hear your thoughts, what you're reading, and how you are taking care of yourself during this difficult time. We just ask that everyone please stay respectful in the chat. Random House will also be providing the link to each of our panelists' books that are currently for sale in the chat. The event will be posted on YouTube and we will send that link out to all guests in case you would like to rewatch or share with your friends and family. I am so happy to turn it over to Sarah Weiss, a Random House Group Executive Editor, who will be moderating the discussion between our authors. And now, Big Ideas Night Finance during coronavirus. Thank you, Katie, and hi, everybody. Um, I know we're really um, eager to jump into tonight's topic, and as Katie said, please feel free to ask questions in the chat feature. And in the meantime, I'm going to share a brief introduction for each of our authors this evening. Jill Schlesinger is the author of Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. She's also an Emmy-nominated and Gracie Award-winning business analyst for CBS News, a weekly guest on NPR's Here and Now, and a certified financial planner. She writes a weekly syndicated column, Jill on Money, and serves as the host of the nationally syndicated radio show, Jill on Money. Alexa Von Tobel is also a certified financial planner and the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital. She's the New York Times bestselling author of Financially Fearless and Financially Forward. She was previously the CEO of LearnVest, which she founded in 2008. In 2015, LearnVest was acquired by Northwestern Mutual in one of the biggest fintech acquisitions of the decade. Following the acquisition, Von Tobel assumed leadership duties at Northwestern Mutual as the chief innovation officer. She has served as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship for the Obama White House and has been featured widely in the media, including being named one of Fortune's most powerful women, appearing on Inc's 30 Under 30 and Forbes's 40 Under 40 lists, receiving Elle's Genius Award, and being named as one of 18 women changing the world by Marie Claire. Antoinette M. Clark is a two-time Emmy Award-winning television producer and the Senior Vice President of Branded Entertainment and Media Innovation at CBS. She has worked as a producer for The Tyra Banks Show, Rachel Ray, and The Nate Berkus Show, and as a director of broadcast sales integration for Martha Stewart Living. In 2017, she was honored with the Black Women in Media Award, and in 2018 was named one of 39 featured in Adweek's annual disruptors list. She is the co-author of Double Down. Trisha Clarkstone is an entrepreneur, innovative marketer, and former CEO of WP Narrative, an award-winning creative tech agency she co-founded with hip hop mogul, Russell Simmons, that was acquired by Hollywood producer, Will Packer. Currently, Trisha is consulting blue chip companies, entertainment brands, and innovative startups. She has earned spots on both Ad Ages and Crane's New York's 40 Under 40, Ad Week's Disruptors list, and Refinery 21, Refinery 29's Black is the New Black list. Her work has been honored at South by Southwest, um, Cons Lions, the Clios, the Shorties, and the Webbies, and she is also the co-author of Double Down. So thank you so much to this all-star lineup of authors for joining us. Um, and I wanna get started um, with our questions. So welcome everybody. I wait for everybody to join mm -hmm. us. Perfect, thank you guys so much for joining us. So I'm just gonna start right in and kind of just begin with the more general question, which is, could you all provide us with one to two financial tips for what you just think generally would be most helpful for people to hear during this time. So I'm going to start with Alexa on this one. Um, first of all, hi, everybody. So happy to be here. And I will tell you, I love my fellow panelists. They're incredibly impressive. Um, and I'm just excited to be here. Um, I would say my, my two tips would be, one, the core of a financial plan is that you truly have a financial plan. And so when times like this are you know, things are scary, things are getting really crazy. Um, this is not the time to begin to become a day trader. This is not the time to decide that you're gonna go in and out of the market. Um, really lean on your certified financial planner. I know both Jill and I are certified financial planners and we believe that the designation is pretty important. Um, so that would be my first thing. And I, I think the second thing is, um, 
at a time like this when everyone's really focused on saving money as much as humanly possible, which is a good thing. Also think about, let's you know, not forget to career plan right now. Let's think about what is my life gonna look like the next three years? How am I gonna think about making more money in my career? And I think in times of scarcity, we get really nervous and we start hunkering down and you know, trying to save money you know, at the grocery store, which um, is not a bad thing to do, but it's also, let's not forget, you know, the most important thing you can do in, 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 for your wallet is actually make more money. So let's start to think about all the ways to make more money. Great. Um, let's go to Trisha. Uh, and I think uh, Alexa is right. Um, she and Jill are certified planners. So Anto and I both definitely hit up our financial planners when this all hit. And that was one of our first phone calls. And I think Anto and I are definitely going to be given, giving more of our practical advice on kind of what we've been doing during this time. And I know one of the first things that I did was I scanned all of my bills and really looked at kind of recurring subscriptions and charges that I had. And I realized that there were so many services that I was paying for that I wasn't really using. And it turned out that I had about $300 worth of recurring monthly services that I was paying for that I had no use for. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge savings um, that definitely helped. And then the other thing that has been hugely um, great during this time is no, I'm not taking any Ubers, no blowouts. Mm -hmm. As you can see, I'm really embracing my curls. Um, I'm not wearing clothes, so no dry cleaning bills. I'm not eating out. So there's a lot that I'm saving that I'm putting directly into my savings um, that I'm definitely putting aside. So that has been a silver lining throughout all of this. Great. Antoinette, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, one quick tip. Um, I'm a big believer. Obviously, we're all at home, but we still need the essentials. So we're still shopping. I've been cooking more than I ever have in my entire life. So I've been buying pots, pans. So I've been using Rakuten. So essentially, they pay mm. you to shop. So you sign up, they have <laughs> thousands of retailers and you get cash back. So between five and 15% on anything that you buy. So you get a check in the mail or they um, put it into your PayPal account. So at least you can accrue those extra dollars when you're still buying the necessities. Mm, that's a great tip. Yeah. All right, last but not least, Jill. So I think these are the times where you do go back to basics. And in addition of scouring your, your monthlies and what's going on, I always cling to cash. Cash is your friend. Cash is queen. I don't like to say king around these parts because we are all <laughs> women, right? This in this chat, uh, and you know, for years it sounds like uh, such boring advice. Have six to twelve months of living expenses in a safe place, and then you get a pandemic that starts as a health pandemic. It becomes a financial pandemic, and the fallout is so intense, and you realize the power of a safety net and what it can do for you and your family. So I can't stress enough, the six to 12 months of living expenses is your best friend. And on the other end of the spectrum, Sarah, don't roll your eyes when I say this. Okay. Because Sarah knows I love talking about death and you know this is not a great <laughs> time about that. But there's no other time where I could think of where I don't have to make the case. You know, you should have your will and your power of attorney and your healthcare proxy. And you should have those documents created. And if your parents haven't done it, this is an excellent time to kick their asses and to guilt them into doing this. Because you're home, hopefully you're all healthy. These documents need to be created. They are your guideposts if something goes wrong. So I'm a natural optimist about life, but I'm really a pessimist as well. I always look at the dark side. And the dark side is have that emergency reserve fund and be sure you've got those end of life planning documents in place. And just to piggyback off of that, because Jill brought it up to me earlier, Jill and anyone else, right now we're obviously in a moment where things are, it's harder to get things done. It's harder to do things in person. If you do not have a will or you have not undertaken that um, those steps yet. How Do you have any suggestions for how one would start that process, especially now that things are being done remotely? 
Well, it's very difficult to get an estate attorney to do your documents right now. You could certainly go online and Quicken has a will maker. It's, it's, it's adequate. Um, at the very least, if you need to have a document created and signed, there are many states that will allow a teleconference like this for a document signing, but there are procedures you have to take. And if you're going to be signing documents remotely, with your witnesses, with attorneys, please be careful. This is something where you do wanna actually consult an attorney to make sure that you have that and the notaries are there. You know, it's interesting, my mother-in-law is 96 years old and she's in a, you know, a nice assisted living place. And one of the things that I was very clear about early on that they were on lockdown. What did we do? We, we actually put a note up in her apartment on the inside of her apartment door and said, here are my healthcare proxies. If anything happens, please contact them immediately. I cannot underscore how important that is, especially when people are alone or locked down in this environment. That's great advice. Um, okay, moving on slightly. Um, unfortunately, um, during this crisis, many people have lost their jobs, um, have been furloughed, have been laid off. And so I'm wondering what advice you all would give to people who have either been temporarily fur furloughed or have lost their jobs. And also as an addendum, what they should do about their retirement accounts, which I'm sure many people are thinking about. Um, so uh, I'll let whoever wants to kind of jump in there, jump in. Or I can call it someone. <laughs> <laughs> Antoinette, do you have any feelings about it? Yeah, I can start. So I would lean heavily into what I call the three R's, reframe, regroup, and revisit. So you want to reframe your outlook and learn, lean into what you have control over. Obviously, you have no control over being let go or furloughed. So what in your life can you control and really focus on that and regroup with your thoughts and do things for yourself. So whether, that, whether that's meditating or figuring out how you're going to pivot and come up with your own plan. And then the last, revisit your finances. You have to restructure your whole budget because the budget that worked for you prior is not going to work for you now. That's great. Alexa, I think I cut you off. Are you going to chime in? I was just going to jump in. I was going to say, uh, you know, we're at a time of truly unprecedented unemployment. We're, you know, at 36 plus million uh, Americans unemployed. And keep in mind, there's only 165 million uh, roughly Americans that can go to work um, because you know the rest are below the age of 18, the rest are below the age of seven or above the age of 70. So I think for, for me, um, the first thing I would just say is um, we've never encountered anything like this as a society. And I know that if tomorrow I was let go, uh, it would take a real blow to my confidence. I would be in a moment where uh, I'd want to eat ice cream and sit in bed for two days and like regroup. And so I love Antoinette's reframe concept. Um, it just, this is the moment to get active. I would literally rip out your computer and email everybody that you can to say, this is not the moment to say, I'm so sorry, I lost my job, I'm gonna hide in the closet. This is actually the moment to say, hey, we're like really in an unprecedented life moment. Uh, I'm available, I wanna do work, here are the things I'm really excited about. If anybody's interested, um, I wanna put my hand up. And this is the time to network like crazy. We're all available, we're all sitting in our homes, we're all on Zoom. And mm -hmm. in fact, like people really, really, the community thing that I think is, is coming alive is we are in this together. And I think uh, we all, everybody on this call also would take a 10 minute phone call to say, oh, how do I connect you with so-and-so? Somebody is looking for somebody of that role or, and so I think it's just the moment to reach out, not to go uh, insular. And then the only thing you asked about your retirement account, you know, in a perfect world, your retirement account is set it and forget it. You know, I'm 36 years old. My, you know, I, hope to retire around 70. And so for me, you know, that retirement account is properly asset allocated and I, I don't have to think about it. So this isn't the time to say, let me go and again, start day trading. This is really where um, I would say that the best thing you can do if at this point in your life, you don't have somebody that you can lean on for financial advice, get one and set up at least monthly phone calls for 30 minutes. So, you know, I sitting here as a CFP, I do at least, at least a minimum 30 minutes every month with our planners uh, and they plan for us and I want an objective third party um, so that my husband and I make good decisions. So that's the other thing I would say is have somebody and you know, you can go to Schwab, Vanguard, et cetera, lots of places out there. They will give you somebody that you can chat with even if you have small dollars. So please do that, make use of it. Great. 
Jill, you wanna chime in? Yeah, I think it's really difficult. Um, I, I'm feeling especially um, worried about young graduates who, um, you know, maybe even anyone who's been out of school for 10 years or graduating right now, I'm very concerned that, you know, when you graduate into a recession, it's hard and your earnings are really an uphill slog. You're gonna lag people who are just lucky enough to graduate in a good market. Now, I think everyone's given really terrific advice here. Um, I, I think that if you, if you had the rug pulled out from under you, you raise your hand, you say, I'd like to do something, you, you volunteer, frankly, every single one of these charitable organizations all over this country, they need people. They're all at the financial precipice. So if you have some skills or you just want to say, I'll try, that's a foot in the door and it's creating some skills. And you know, if you've got student loans, federal student loans, the, the clock is sort of frozen until September 30th, so that's good. If you're lucky enough that you have a partner who can help you maybe keep that footing, that's great. If not, if you're unemployed and you're really in trouble, don't forget, you get to ask for help in this time. You didn't do anything wrong. It's called forbearance. Mm -hmm. So you go and you find out and say to your landlord, I can't do this. I need some help. You talk to even a private lender. If you've got a private student loan, you say, I, I can't do this. I'm, I can't get a job. I can't support this. So raise your hand in the same way that Alexa just said, you know, don't hide. Don't hide from the people who you know you owe money to, whether it's your internet service provider, your credit card company, whoever. Just raise your hand, say, I'm impacted by this. I need help. And just understand what the terms are for, because, you know, most of these places are not like the Red Cross. They're not exactly very excited to help you out. So just understand that if you're getting some help for the next few months, when does the clock start again? What will I owe? What are the terms? And just raise your hand. Great. I also, wanna, yeah, try men. Sorry. I also think, you know, we're living in an age of a, you know, creative uh, economy, right? So I think depending on the field that you're in, there are tons of platforms and tools that you can use based on your skill set or your hobby. So there's a platform called Patreon, where depending on your craft, you can basically go onto this platform and if you're an artist, if you have a particular skill set, you can basically go on and accumulate fans and they can basically come on and subscribe to creations and things that you might want to put out into the world. And that can help and fuel you until you may, might be able to find a full-time job. So I think it's really embracing your skill set, your talents, and leaning into platforms like Patreon that um, allow you to really share your talents with the world and then have these patrons really um, get behind and support you. That's great advice. Cool. Um, all right, I'm going to go to Jill first on this one. Um, we've been hearing, obviously, in the news every day, every week, the stock market goes up, it goes down. Um, it's hard to sort of know what to think. And so my question for all of you guys um, is, how do you approach that? I think Alexis sort of answered it in the last question to a degree, but how, you know, obviously somebody in their 20s or in their 30s who are just starting out, that's very different than somebody who's nearing retirement age, is, is at retirement age. Do you have any advice, depending on where you are in your life, about how to sort of, you know, deal with the uh, instability in the market right now? So I'm going to go to Jill first because I know she can speak to this. So like Alexa said, we hope that you have some sort of investment that is automated, right? And the easiest way to do that is through your retirement account. So let's use the retirement account as your example. I put a certain percentage away. I'm still lucky enough to have a job, but wow, the end of March freaked me out. And it was the end of the quarter and it was the end of the month. And I looked and I got anxious and maybe it was the first time I had really been investing throughout a, a bear market and you're freaked and that's okay. You're supposed to be freaked. You're a human being, you've got emotions, you're allowed to be freaked out. The issue really is, as Alexa said, can you take that emotion and not act on it? Mm -hmm. And that's really the critical issue, that if you've got some sort of game plan in place, can you refrain from letting that freaked out feeling prompt you to do something. So hopefully you don't do something. Now that said, 
people sometimes are a little bit um, cavalier about risk while markets are rising. And I'm sure we've all done that. Markets going up. And you're like, oh my God, I'm making so, so much money and I'm kind of a genius. You're not, it's okay. Um, and all of a sudden, it's sort of, you look at your portfolio and maybe you look at your quarterly state. Wow, I got so much money. And maybe you've taken on more risk than you really feel comfortable assuming. And maybe that March moment was a moment of sanity where you said, oh my God, I, I really had too much risk. Or, oh my God, I needed some of this money for a home down payment and I screwed myself by having too much risk. So if you need money within the next year, that money can't be at risk. So if you messed up and you need to get the money out of the market because you messed up, okay, fine. But if possible, you just ride this out. And even for people who are older, you know, I host a daily podcast and every minute that I get an email, it starts with, I'm not a market timer, but I was wondering if I should sell some of my stocks, which is great. I love that. Right. <laughs> but the, yeah. So the, the problem is that even if you're older and you're retired or maybe you're watching this and you've got parents and you're worried about them and you say to yourself, well, mom's 65 years old. How is she going to absorb the loss? You remind yourself, mom's going to probably live for 20, 25 more years. So hopefully she's got an allocation or she's got a financial planner who can help her walk through this. So I've talked too much, but um, it's really important if possible that you don't mess with your portfolio once you have an allocation that fits your risk profile. Perfect. Um, all right, Antoinette, you want to you wanna chime in on this one? Well, I'm glad to hear everything that she just said, because that's exactly what I was doing. Um, obviously, <laughs> I don't have the financial background, but I was worried just looking at all of my stocks, my 401k and everything dipping. So I called my financial advisor. We spoke and he was like, just hang tight and things will start looking up. And they actually have. But I've, um, yeah, but I promised myself only to look every two weeks because it was stressing me out looking weekly. So I've just been calm and staying steady and leaving everything in place. Great. Trisha? Same. The only thing that I have been doing um, is keeping track of stocks, right? And seeing where there are opportunities um, playing the market. So I've been um, buying stocks, um, you know, when I've seen dips, knowing, um, just taking advantage of when I see market dips and gotten some good gains, especially early on in, in March when there were some, some dips. So taking advantages when I see some, but for the most part, staying pretty steady and not taking any big risks. Great. Alexa, do you want to answer this one too? I think the only thing I would just second is what's so important about having um, a somebody you can turn to call a financial um, expert is we're all human, right? We get emotional. There were moments where I was like, the world is over. And then, you know, of course, you know, sanity would prevail. Or there were moments <laughs> my husband was like, the world is over. And so remember, uh, a wallet is often the household. And there's often two parents or two adults that are in that household. And I think it's really important to just remember that um, I don't always need to be the therapist uh, for, you know, my partner and vice versa. And that's what makes a third person really valuable in these moments. It's for these moments that you have a financial planner. During the good times, planning is relatively easy. It's actually extremely critical for moments like this when you need somebody to be there to be a mirror to say, please don't make it, you know, again, that third party is so valuable. And it's not just for you, remember that. It's also for if you have somebody else that's part of the planning process, a partner, a spouse, et cetera, you both need it. And sometimes you may be the crazy one, sometimes he or she may be the crazy one. It's really valuable for the partnership. Yeah, that's great advice. I'm going to um, just chime in with an, uh, somebody from the audience because I thought it's slightly related, which is somebody has asked if you all grew up in a house where your parents taught you about how to take care of money or, how, or if they, whether or not they gave you good advice or not good advice, somebody's wondering sort of more personally how you guys all um, grew up. Alexa, you look ready to I'm just like laughing because I'm in my like high school bedroom right now um, <laughs> in Florida. Um, so I feel like really close to this. I mean, actually just to really make everybody feel great. Like here is underneath where I am is like my yearbook. Like my mom, like kept <laughs> so just really want to bring some levity to this moment. Um, I feel very in touch with my childhood at this moment. Um, and 
you know, I think the thing, so, you know, I grew up in a uh, very kind of, I would say standard middle-class family. My uh, dad was a pediatrician. My mom uh, is a nurse. My dad had passed away when I was younger. And so I had a single mom from 14 onwards raise our family. And what was so amazing, I think, was the fact that money was very matter of fact, and actually I was brought into money decision. So it wasn't because money was like abundant and everywhere. It was very much, you know, I, th I think it was, it, was, it was on the table and it was on the table in an unemotional way mm -hmm. of we have this bill or when I got into college, it was like college costs this much. And it wasn't a college cost so much or college costs nothing, but it was, like, it was, it was on the table. I was saving for college, I think my whole life, honestly. I remember saving for college when I came out of the womb. And it's just, that muscle is in my brain and I'm now doing it for my child. And I think what's so helpful is to have it on the table mm -hmm. because you're developing habits and your children are watching you. And I learned, I just adopt the same habits. My mom would buy never the brand name, you know, orange juice, or it was always, cause she was like, I'd rather that money be able to go on a family trip. And I do the same thing today. And so I think what's so important is like, we all grow into our parents in some capacity. And, you know, even if money isn't abundant, I think it's so important to just know that money isn't something you're hiding from and it's not something where your head's under the table and that you can just approach it unemotionally. Um, and I'll end just by saying that there's a lot of research behind, um, you know, if, if money is something where you have horrifying negative memories of because it was so stressful, you have to overcome that in order to be more productive as an adult. Whereas if it's just very matter of fact, you actually have like a natural open-mindedness to, to dealing with money. And so just remember, even if you don't have a ton of money, you can actually give your kids comfort with money simply by putting it on the table. That's great advice. So the other part of this question, which I didn't read, was somebody also asked if Trisha and Antoinette are twins, which they are. They're so beautiful. <laughs> So I'll let you guys answer as I assume you grew up in the same household. <laughs> yes, we're twins. So we grew up in the same household and similar to Alexa, our, we were raised by a single mom who migrated from Jamaica. So we kind of were a team with our mom. Um, so all money conversations were very open as well. So we knew very early on what our mom was saving versus what she was willing to spend on and um, also paying close attention to not splurging on things that weren't going to service in the long run. So I think we also have been using those muscles from such a young age that we still do it today. So we have our splurge bucket, we have our day-to-day -day bucket, and we have our savings bucket. And you determine what's important and when, and really leveraging all those when you need it. Trish, what do you think? And I think uh, I remember too, there was one thing because um, a lot of, uh, we say we were raised by committee because we have four aunts that also came over from Jamaica that pitched in to help raise us. And they created something called partner. And that was where all of the aunts every week to really foster this element of saving every week, everyone would put in a pot of money into the partner so that they made sure that everyone saved. And then at the end of the month, everyone would get the pot of money and they would recycle this to make sure that everyone would save. And then you would get the pot of that savings, you know, every week. So there was this notion of you had to, every week you had to put in your amount. And then at the end of the month, you would be able to kind of get the full thing. So there was always this notion of you were saving for something big, whether it was our high school, you know, tuition or our dance classes, but you had to kind of put the money aside to make sure that um, you would have it for like the bigger thing. So that's definitely something that we still live by. Uh, Jill, I think I know, to be, to be totally transparent with this, I happen to edit Jill's book. So I know a little bit more about Jill than the other authors on this call. But so Jill, I think I know a little bit about the answer to this question for you, but I'll, I'll let you tell everyone else. Yeah, I grew up with a father who was a trader on the floor of the American Stock Exchange, whose uh, days were framed as uh, when he walked in the door, my mother would say, how did we do? And he would say a dollar amount. So money was very out there in the conversation. Also, it is why I have such a filthy mouth. I'm going to be very good on this, <laughs> but that is true. And I admit to it right now. <laughs> um, so uh, I, and my dad was a trader before traders made a gazillion dollars. It was like a journeyman job. And um, so we talked very openly about money. And I think that uh, 
really the peculiar circumstance of growing up in a family like that is about uh, demystifying money. And, uh, you know, when I wrote the book, I put this chapter in about how people make their kids nuts about money. And they don't mean to. It's just that, you know, parents pass on habits, good and bad, and then kids react either embrace it, become it, or react against it. So it's one of the reasons why I think it's great if you are a parent to at least kind of get real with your money issues because you just want to break a cycle. If you know you had a spendthrift parent and you're a little bit like that, why am I like that? What do I need to do? It's that conversation you really want to have. So um, I'm very fortunate and there was nary a struggle and uh, thankfully I came out of the womb not really caring about money all that much and when I was I started my career as a trader and in fact somewhat failed at that job because you really have to love money and I didn't love it as much as I thought I would like it but it was fun for a few years. Great. Um, I'm going to go on to another question um, that's about small businesses. We've been hearing a lot about small business, small business owners, about entrepreneurs, about people who are self-employed. Um, I know that's a, three different things wrapped up into that question, but if you all would speak to sort of what advice you might give to either those who are self-employed or entrepreneurs or running small businesses right now, um, if you have any, you know, one to two um, tips of advice for people. Um, I'll start with Alexa. This is obviously so dear to my heart. Um, uh, I'm now a serial entrepreneur and now I run a venture fund, a $200 million fund called Inspired Capital, where I focus on investing in entrepreneurs. So this is what I think about all day long. Um, I would say a few things. Uh, remember if you're a small business owner, I think you're doing something really important, which is you're betting on yourself. Um, and that is a bet that I would take every day, every hour over and over is to bet on myself. Um, that said, I think it's really important to make sure that you have, you know, I'm not the person who jumps off a cliff. I'm the person who would like perfectly devise the plan to go and jump off a cliff um, and like make sure there was a boat next to me once I went down and there was a doctor. And so I think it's just really important through this, you know, this is a small business led financial crisis. Um, and I think COVID exposed now a small business led financial crisis. So I think it's really important that we keep that in mind. And, you know, two people I would lean on a lot right now is your accountant and your lawyer. Um, so those are two places to never underspend. Those are not the places to cut money. And then when it comes to your financial plans, you know, I always joke, I have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. Your plan A is your A plus plan. You're going to go swing for the fences. Your plan D is what happens literally when every single thing that can go wrong goes wrong. And once you have that plan D and you can put it under your pillow at night, you actually sleep a lot better because it's, you're no longer in free fall. You know what would happen if something really bad happened. And so um, the, the final thing, I, just again, I would add is this is a time to lean on your community. As I was building LearnVest, you know, LearnVest ended up being a success story. It was a really hard company to build. I worked every day of building LearnVest. There was not one day where I was like, whoo, this is an easy company. <laughs> Miserable. It was really hard. Um, it turned out well, but I had what I called like my team of advisors. They were fellow entrepreneurs. They were my red phones. One of them is now my business partner. We uh, founded Inspired Capital together. She found a paperless post, which I'm sure you've all used. Um, but go gather your community. Get the five smartest other small business owners you know that are local to you or that you know in your life and make them your friends, your board of advisors, and be honest with them. What's working? What's not? Listen to them. What are they doing? What are they not? And just remember, people want to help. People want to share the community is very ecosystem driven. So find your friends. Great. Uh, Jill, you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, I, I owned a small business. I hated every day of it for 14 years. I was not a good small business owner. Uh, I was an accidental one. I love the idea of having plan A, B, C, D. Um, and I think that, um, you know, sometimes when there's a crisis, it lays bare problems in a business. And um, what I, I hope that people hear this the right way, but you know, not every business is meant to succeed. And before you start mortgaging yourself to the hilt or borrowing tons of money, it's really worthwhile if you're struggling as a small business person or an entrepreneur to say, hey, if I've got plan D and plan D is not working, what do I need to do to wind this down successfully? And um, and I, it's like the market, you know, everything's fine when things are fine. Um, but if you are at a place where you've got to make a terrible choice, 
Um, I like leaning on your professionals and your board of directors, your board of advisors, but you know, you also may have to make hard decisions about, I can't carry this many people. And maybe that's not the best thing for the business to carry all these people. Or maybe you're learning a great lesson, which is, hey, in this crisis, what I found out was I don't need as many people and we're doing okay. So be honest with yourself. It, that, that's the one thing I would say that as a business owner, um, it requires that you're brutally honest with yourself. And if you have partners, you just all have to really be on the same page. A crisis is absolutely um, something to get through, but it's not worth getting through it if you're going to all get dragged down the drain together. And so you really need to be pretty smart about this and, and to play triage here. Um, Trisha, Antoinette, I know you guys um, are in the entrepreneurial space. What would you, what would you guys say to this question? So Nate, um, Nate, you want to go first or me? Oh, you can go. Okay. So I think a few things. Um, I think obviously as uh, entrepreneurs, you want to, one big thing, entrepreneurs are always solving problems. So I think you want to make sure that you continue um, on that path. And obviously now you're solving even more problems because you're being faced with probably deficits and dealing with clients and figuring out where, where your revenue is coming from. Um, I think the other piece is really honing in on diversification of your revenue streams um, and really looking at how you might be able to evolve your services and your products so you can expand your clientele because you want to make sure that all your eggs aren't in one basket. Um, one thing too, it's maybe also taking it back to the old school and really leaning into new currencies, looking at barter and trade, the barter and trade economy. Like if I give you this service for this service so that you can kind of keep your capital in, in place because, and your cash flow. So, you know, I did that the other day. I'm working on an artificial intelligence project and I needed to uh, budget out a project. And the person that was going to budget it out for me, he needed some creative concepts. So I was like, great, I'll give you creative concepts. You budget out this project for me. So no cash change hands. We just bartered out our services. So then we were each able to kind of keep our capital in place. So I think it's, uh, you know, going back to that and it's as easy as basically pricing out what it would have cost if each of us did that and then said, okay, here's what it would be. Um, the other thing is too, at, at, if you're self-employed or, or an entrepreneur, looking at the currencies that you have around you. The other day I was looking around my apartment and I was like, do I really need that Chanel bag? Do I really need those, you know, Alexander Wang boots? Do I need that cause doll? And I just started taking inventory. And I said, and then I looked in the real reel and I was like, if I put all this stuff up on the real reel, look what I could make. And obviously I'm not gonna do anything with it, but I know if I needed to, that's like, I could basically pop it all on and then I know what I could get for it. So I think it's just kind of having those like contingencies and knowing that you, you have capital if you need to. So I think it goes back to what Alexa was saying, having your plan A, B, and C, if you need to tap into other forms of capital as well. Great. Well, she covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep the ball in, in your court. And I'd love you guys, Antoinette and Tristan, and obviously Alexa and Jill too, to speak to us a little bit about um, if you can just provide us with some advice about how to make your own brand and voice profitable for people who are in the entrepreneur space and the small business space, like what tips would you give for folks out there in that regard? Yeah. So I think it all starts with yourself and from within. And Trisha is an entrepreneur. She's been able to do that at so many different points in her journey. So Trish, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I think it goes back to really your value proposition and really honing in on the results and benefit and the impact that you're truly going to make. Um, and I think it's about honing in on your superpowers. And I think sometimes it's hard for people to truly identify what their superpowers are. And Anton and I always like to say, and we talk about it a lot in Double Down, your superpowers, it's where your passion and your expertise meet. And there are a few questions that we like to ask ourselves when you're trying to hone in on what that is. And it's, what's the common denominator of your proudest moments? And what have you really become known for? So what's your reputation? And what sets you apart from your peers 
Um, and what do you do so effortlessly that it truly feels like magic? So I think once you've really honed in on what that is, then you take your superpower and you start honing those skills and then you apply it and you really start doing the work and you get those proof points and you start building those case studies of the work that you're doing. You package that up, you create your narrative and then you start to socialize it. Just like marketers wrap their brands into stories, you should really be able to do that too and really spread that across your community and create context around that. I think like, um, you know, I recently sold my creative and technology agency and I've been consulting for the past year. So once COVID hit, I was getting concerned because I was like, you know, am I going to really be able to continue to build? I've been consulting for entertainment brands and blue chip companies and some startups. And I remember calling Antoinette and said, you know, am I going to be the first line item that's cut from a lot of these brands? And surprisingly, I wasn't. And the reason is, is because a lot of the work that I've been doing, it's innovation work. And that's the first thing that brands are looking for now in this time. They're looking for reinvention and trying to figure out, all right, how do I reimagine my brand, my products, my services, my messaging? Um, so that's been good. So I think now it's about taking your superpower activating it and seeing how you can solve problems during this time. Great. Antoinette, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think in terms of at this time, I think a lot of people are looking to pivot and try to find a new direction of what they should be doing if what's what they're doing currently isn't working for them. And I say the first thing they need to do is articulate and align on their VPs. So that's their vision, their values, their passion points, and also their purpose. And then once you figure that out, it's all about leaning into your skill set. I'm all about listful thinking. I write a list for everything. And sometimes you have to remind yourself what you're good at. What have you become known for? What do people come to you for help for? And once you've leaned into that, it's about going into the discovery phase and doing due diligence in the area that you're looking to pivot into. So Google should be your best friend at that point because you should be going on to TED Talks, you should be doing research, going on YouTube and figuring out and really understanding that area. And then you want to pressure test what the direction you want to go into with your tribe. So that's your trusted council of friends and also people in the industry. So they can give you insight and tell you if, if you're do, what you're doing is right or what you're doing is wrong. And then at that point, you've, have, you've called all this information, now you're ready to take that leap. And for me, and I'm sure for a lot of people, that's usually when I get scared and I'm like, can I actually do this? So I have to give myself that internal pep talk and remind myself that I am a winner. I've had wins, I've had successes. So I have proof of concept that I was able to do it before so I can actually do it again. Do you guys, thank you so much. That was excellent. Alexa and Jill, do you guys have anything to add to that? The one thing I would just add is, um, you know, th these are times of, you know, just truly so much is changing and happening. These are also massive times of opportunity. Um, and one thing I like to tell people is that change is the constant, right? Prior to this, um, I used to say constantly learning, constantly evolving, constantly adapting, adopting new technology. You know, don't say, oh, I don't like this thing or no, no, it's get on Zoom, get good at it, lean into all of the available technologies. I just think these are moments of Rather than think of these as moments to hide, these are moments to go big. Um, and you know, I dropped out of business school at the bottom of the worst recession in 2008. Uh, that's when I started LearnBass. I have this internal mantra, which is when everybody zigs, zag. When everybody gets scared, go big. Mm -hmm. And it's really because these are asymmetric moments of tremendous opportunity and tremendous value creation. And so I'm not saying please mortgage your house and go do something wild. In fact, the opposite. What I'm really saying is these are moments to really think what new X am I going to adopt? How am I going to think about my business operating differently? What new skill sets am I going to pick up? If you're a small business owner, think about how do you lean into technology in a really different way? How do you be more nimble? And it's really just, again, these are asymmetric moments of opportunity. And so don't see these as moments of, of, of scarcity. See them as moments of opportunity. Great. Thank you. Jill, you have anything to add? Uh, it you know, um, I'm so much older than everybody here by like 112 <laughs> years. And uh, so I just want to remind you that this idea of branding yourself, it just, 
be true to yourself. Know who you are, know what you want to do. Not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur or business owner. Some people are really great at it. Some people are not. Some people are really awesome team people. And some people really love working in large organizations and building their teams. And some people are amazing managers and some, some people suck at it. Don't try to make yourself into something you're not. It's true. I, I agree with Alexa that, you know, absolutely, you've got to like learn these new skills. On the other hand, you know what? It, it, you don't have to be anything. You have to be who you are. And so uh, the word authenticity gets overused so much. Just, just know who you are and be okay with that and try to do the thing that you really want to do. And if you can't do that, you still have to pay the bills. So do something close to that and make that your side hustle. Jill, it's funny you said that Antoine and I talk about that a lot because I'm an entrepreneur and she's an intrapreneur. So obviously I start businesses to drive change, but she steers change within existing companies. And we talk about that a lot because everyone, it's cool to be an entrepreneur, but it's also cool to be an entrepreneur because you can still have be that change agent within existing corporations and and um, and businesses. Especially if you don't have the stomach to be an entrepreneur, I get Ajita. She can. Handle <laughs> it. I can't handle it. So to have the constructs and the support of a big organization, but still to be able to create change and. Um, create impact for them in such a great way mm -hmm. has been so rewarding for me. So not everyone has to be the entrepreneur since it's such the it thing to do now. That's great advice. So we're running close to the end, but I wanted to get in um, a reader or two questions from readers, but from audience members. Um, one is, you know, if you don't have the money right now to afford a financial planner, um, what resources would you guys suggest if that's just not something in the cards for you now. Jill, you wanna jump in? Sure. Um, and there are these things called robo-advisors, which are online investment platforms that now actually offer advice. And they're really affordable, they're awesome. And you know, some of them are offered through big places like Vanguard has it, but you may have heard of uh, Betterment or Wealthfront. Um, and, and these can be really good options. They can be affordable options. Um, there are some organizations that charge uh, monthly retainers. And so if you are looking for a, a low cost or a hybrid option, some, some place where you can get some advice, but not for that much money, a robo advisor is a really good place to start. Um, and, you know, if you, you don't think you have enough money, it's still worth potentially looking at a fee only financial planner, someone who will just charge you a fee to create a plan. Um, and there are a lot of uh, those folks can be found at a place called NAPFA, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. It's napfa.org. I'll put a plug in for the CFP website, which is letsmakeaplan.org. But again, you know, there's a lot of places that you can start. And frankly, it's many of the things that you think are really hard about financial planning. They start with three main parts of this, which is you know you need to get that emergency reserve fund, that six to 12 months of your living expenses in a safe place. You know you need to pay down your debt and you know you need to start to contribute to your retirement plan. And all those things are predicated on you understanding what money's coming in and what money's going out. There, I just did your financial plan, it was free. <laughs> Buy my book. <laughs> always, always selling. Do you guys, the rest of you guys wanna chime in on that one? No pressure to. to Alexa. <laughs> No, I mean, I think um, Jill said it, which is um, embrace technology. There's tons of really great free apps out there that can uh, really be incredible. Um, you know, a Betterment app is a wonderful one. It's robo uh, auto uh, will adjust. Um, I believe at some point we'll have self-driving wallets, which will be wonderful. It's a long time out, um, but I'm excited for the day when my Amazon Alexa can also like run my finances for me. Um, but between now and then, um, I, I just think it's so important for you not to make excuses around why you're not getting advice, right? Mm -hmm. Like to Jill's point, it's not, in a, it's not too expensive. In fact, one small financial mistake can cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. So it's absolutely critical that, you know, especially in a moment like this, that you go and find somebody. Yeah, that's smart. So I'm gonna wrap this up with one last question from an audience member, which is, how do you all think um, the pandemic is going to affect renters and potential home buyers mm -hmm. in the next few years? I'll let whoever wants to jump in, jump in. 
I'll have yeah. a, just like one quick thing, which is, um, this is not like the time to make a tremendous financial decision. Um, I have so many friends calling me saying I'm moving them and I'm like, just deep breath, right? Like <laughs> truly when, when moments of tremendous change like this happens, um, just let's like wait for the world to settle a bit. That doesn't mean, you know, if you are, are abundantly in a good financial place, you know, maybe there's really asymmetric ways to go buy a great home or something like that, right? Um, so I'm not saying that you cannot make money doing that. I'm just saying for your permanent residence where you live to on a dime, make a big change out of fear. There's a rule, never make decisions after a major tragedy or out of a moment of tremendous fear. Like th that good financial decisions don't get made out of those. So those would be my quick points. That's great. Yeah, I think I, I agree. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I keep getting questions like, oh, I was looking for a house. Should I keep looking? Should I not look? And, you know, uh, most of this goes back to, you know, what does your personal circumstance look like? Um, I, I think in, we're going to, we, we're going to know a lot more six months from now. And the housing market is not going to be the greatest buy of the century or the worst sale of the century in the next six months. So you don't have to really worry about that. I think that if you are in the market and you are still looking and you're employed and you feel good and you ran the numbers at the beginning of the year and you said you wanted to buy a house, you wanted to buy an apartment, keep looking. Mortgage rates are pretty cheap and don't get freaked out. And by the way, I have a chapter in my book. One of the dumb things is that you buy when you should rent. So don't think that buying is the be all end all because it's not. It sucks. I have two houses and I hate it both times. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pain in the ass to do it. And you know what? Renting gives you freedom. It gives you opportunity. It may give you an opportunity for you to go across country and take a job that you wouldn't take otherwise. So don't feel bad if, if you're renting and you're a happy renter. It's totally fine. It's great to know. And do you guys, Antoinette and Trisha, do you want to chime in on this one or? Well, I was thinking a lot of what Jill just said, because obviously being a renter, I'm a renter in New York and also LA because of this pandemic and not understanding what parts of the country is gonna be hit worse, mm -hmm. having the mobility and being able to just pick up and leave if I need to is reassuring, opposed to having a house and all the expenses and to be stuck somewhere. But I have also been looking just at the market and seeing what's out there because some of the prices have been lower just to explore, but I am happy being a renter. Great. Trisha, anything to add? Uh, no, I think that they, they covered everything. Well, I'm going to um, wrap this up because we're near and close to the hour. Um, thank you guys all so much. Um, this was really great. I know this is a really tough time for people and financially incredibly tough um, and uncertain. So really thank you all so much for being here and um, really just great to see all your faces and your books are incredible and I hope everyone finds them and buys them and gets some great advice from them. So thank you all and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, ladies. Bye. Thank you the most amazing panelists. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Excellent Bye. panelists. Bye. Bye.